Hello, everyone. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. If you are just joining us, welcome to the first ever Winter Wonder Virtual Festival presented by the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. If you were here from an earlier session, welcome back. My name is Lizzie Steers. I am the Outreach Liaison with the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. If you would like to earn the special Winter Explorer Junior Ranger badge that we are using for this event, please send the park a message with the name of the presentation or presentations you attended, as well as a short statement about what you learned. You can send this to the park email or you can message it to the park Facebook or Instagram accounts. So that information will be added into the chat. This next upcoming presentation is Boston Harbor Winter Waterbirds. Boston Harbor is seasonally inhabited by a rich variety of waterbird species. But during the winter, the population is most diverse. We have waterfowl, loons, grebes, cormorants, gulls, shorebirds, and so many more. The magnificent snowy owl and other raptors also periodically visit the harbor islands in search of solitude and prey. We'll hear about the annual comings and goings of different winter waterbird species, as well as information about their breeding and feeding behavior, and some of the, con uh, the, some of the conservation issues, issues facing certain species. I would now like to introduce you to our presenter. This is Wayne Peterson. Wayne is the uh, Mass Audubon Director of the Important Bird Area, or IBA program. Wayne has lectured and conducted birding, birding workshops extensively for more than 40 years, and his tour guide experiences have taken him around the world. His publications have included The Field Guide to Birds of Massachusetts. He is a co-author of The Birds of Massachusetts and Birds of New England, and is a co-editor of the Massachusetts Breeding Bird Atlas 1 and 2. In 2005, he was also the recipient of the American Birding Association, Association's Award for Outstanding Contributions in Regional Ornithology. We encourage you all to send questions into Wayne throughout the presentation. You'll see that on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there will be a Q&A button. Um, feel free to put your questions in there. You can also type them directly into the chat. This recession is recorded, um, and there's also an option to turn on closed captioning on your own screen if you are interested. Hi, Wayne. Welcome to Winter Wonder. The floor is all yours. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in this Winter Wonder. And um, as I was explaining, basically, um, what we're going to do is a, essentially a, a virtual um, look at some of the water birds that inhabit the uh, Boston Harbor in the wintertime. And um, one of the things about the Harbor Islands is that basically the only way to see them is um, by boat. And one of the sort of background pieces to this entire weekend is the fact that traditionally at this time of the year, there is an opportunity to take a winter wildlife trip on one or another of the, the Harbor cruise boats to give people a look at, at the islands and some of the wildlife um, that occurs out there. This is sort of a bird's eye view, shall we say, of um, the Harbor Islands, of which there's approximately 35 islands. Some of them are fairly large, some of them are quite small, some of them are basically gravel bars that are uh, exposed at low tide. But the bottom line is they are variously inhabited um, throughout the year by birds of one sort or another. But a lot of the water birds in the wintertime are really not so dependent on the islands specifically as the waters around them. So I think that's one of the things that's important. If we were to go out to one of the islands and look back at the city of Boston, we might see something that sort of has this look, depending upon the day. It might not look quite this glorious uh, today, but certainly uh, in the winter, it is pretty. It's also pretty chilly on occasion, and sometimes the water can be uh, um, uncomfortably rough, depending on how much wind there is or what the uh, tides are doing and so forth. So I think one of the ways to begin this, this little journey is to sort of ask the question, what are winter water birds? But needless to say, um, as we'll see, there's there are lots of different kinds, different species of water birds that use the harbor in the wintertime. Um, they basically kind of break out into the um, groups below, waterfowl, loons and grebes, the northern gannet and the great cormorant kind of dangling out there by themselves, gulls, 
and alcids. And if the term alcid doesn't register, basically it includes birds that are in the auk and puffin family and uh, are sort of penguin-esque in appearance, even though they're not terribly closely related to penguins. Now, I think um, with a little luck here, we, we can insert a quiz. Um, I had provided a, a little sort of uh, before and after exercise for people. And it's very simple. There's only about uh, four questions. I don't know whether, yeah, there you go. Um, so you can participate. This is a little moment of interactivity here since you've probably been sitting around wondering when the heck is this guy gonna get started. Uh, but one of the, um, the first questions, and there's only four, this is nothing you need to get your blood pressure uh, elevated over. Where do you think most of the Boston Harbor winter waterbirds breed in the summer? In other words, do they go anywhere or are they birds that nest right here in Massachusetts or do they come from some distance away? And the options are either their residents, they stay here year round so that we'd see them in the winter as well as at other seasons. The interior Western United States, Canada or the Great Lakes region. So you can, um, as soon as you've answered those in your own mind or wherever, you can hit the end polling and we can move on. And if you keep your eyes and your ears open, hopefully um, the answers to the other several questions will, uh, will be revealed as we go through the, the program. We still have some votes, so they're still pouring in. So I'm gonna give it a, a moment or two more. Okay. It's interesting to look at the percentages and see what uh, what they look like. Yeah, it really is. It's hard not to let that influence your own vote. That's true. That's true. Since we uh, we've just been through several weeks, months of um, issues surrounding polling, this <laughs> this is yet another example of uh, of how this can work. So you can move that along anytime you think uh, you've got the answers. We don't have to sit and look at the, the polls. Well, so they'll come up one at a time for each question. Oh, okay, that's fine. So these are the results for the first question. So it looks like Canada was the uh, hands down winner in terms of people's perception of where most of these water birds come from. Okay. Number two. So of these four different kinds of waterfowl, AKA ducks, which one of these species was formally called old squaw? The red-breasted merganser? the long-tailed duck, the common golden eye, or the white-winged scoter. One of the things that people who are interested in birds or who study birds have to get used to is the fact that it's almost like a game of, of checkers or chess. Periodically, it seems that the names change and the classification is affected and influenced and it's, uh, it's kind of like a kaleidoscope. You turn the, turn the little wheel and <laughs> all of a sudden a bird you knew as one name has, has become something else or it's classified differently. And needless to say, DNA has had a lot to do with how we classify and, and group birds these days. But So it looks like the long-tailed duck is out in front on this one. The red breast and these are the final results. Nipping its and its heels. And you don't have to be embarrassed if you don't know the answer or even what some of these creatures are. That's presumably why you're taking this little winter workshop. So no pressure. Would you like me to move on to the next question? I'd love it. Thank you.
Okay, there's four different species of gulls that are listed here. The ring-billed gull, the great black-backed gull, the Bonaparte's gull, and the herring gull. What two gull species nest in Boston Harbor? So for this one, you can, you can click two. If that, I don't know whether you can do that. Uh, let's hope you can. Well, a lot of people seem to think the herring gull is a good candidate. And the great black back gull and the ring bill gull are almost neck and neck. We have some requests um, to know what the answer was for number two. Sure, but I think, well, I can give them to you right now. Or I was gonna say, if you wanna wait until the very end, then you can sort of test yourself and then I'll give them to you. I can do it either way since time will be of the essence here. After we do the four, I'll give you the answers to all four right now and then we can move on. <clears throat> How's that? Oh, look at that ring bill and black back go. Pretty close. All right, it doesn't look like the lines are moving too far at this point if you wanna move on to uh, number four. All right, so which of the Boston Harbor winter water birds is famous for the high quality of its warm feathers? That is to say the feathers actually have some um, commercial value in some places. The brant, the northern gannet, the American black duck, or the common eider? Which one of those is well known, at least in some quarters, for the value of its feathers because of their insulating properties and, and how warm they are with they're used commercially for clothing or puffs and pillows and throws and things. And those are the results for the final question. Well, it looks like we have a clear winner here. Okay, well, so I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just give you the answers very quickly to the four questions, and then we can move on. And the first question was to recap, what do most Boston, where do most Boston Harbor winter water birds breed in the summer? And the answer was Canada. So it looks like we've got a lot of winners on this one. And that's absolutely true. For question number two, which of these duck species was formerly called the old squaw and that's letter B, the long-tailed duck. The bird was so named because it's a very talkative duck, um, makes a lot of noise, but ironically, and maybe not so ironically, it's the males that usually do the talking and, and make the noise. So in addition to um, the inappropriateness of its name as it relates to um, Native American cultures and all, it was inappropriate um, for those two reasons. And then in Europe, the same bird, the old squaw, has for years been called the long-tailed duck. So um, North Americans finally got with the program and changed the name to long-tailed duck. Number three, the two gull species that nest in Boston Harbor, and this is interesting because we have a lot of different gull species that can variously be seen in the harbor, but indeed the herring gull and the great black-backed gull uh, are the two winners for that one. And we'll talk a little bit about the others as we go along. And then finally, um, for question number four, the uh, bird that's famous for the quality of its feathers in terms of their insulating properties is indeed the common eider. And that's another story that we can talk a little bit about in a few minutes. So it looks like a lot of you did quite well and uh, arguably many of you probably got all four of them right, which is good. So you can shut that down if you would like, that's screen if everybody's done with it and we'll move on.
Yep, you are good to go, Wayne. Oh, I see, I can do that. All right. So these are, are some of these winter water birds as, uh, as noted. And let's see, we wanna continue here. So these factoids, this is just a potpourri of, of things that will give you some look backs in a sense in terms of uh, your answers, but there'll be others as we go along. Um, first of all, most water bird species are migratory. So that, that's kind of an, a, a given um, in, in many respects. And the fact that, as you can see, most of them breed north of Massachusetts, there's the link to why Canada um, is the source of many of our winter water birds in terms of uh, this season. Most different kinds of winter water birds forage in a variety of different ways and on a variety of different foods, which is one of the reasons that, in fact, um, we can sustain such a, a, a diversity of water birds in the wintertime. There are obviously different choices of, of food possibilities and the birds themselves are equipped to obtain that food in different ways. So Boston Harbor is really a very good habitat for a lot of these water birds in the wintertime. Um, food availability and breeding success can often determine how common we find water birds in the winter. In other words, some winters, there are some species that are more common than others and some that, that really um, either on a seasonal basis from year to year show fluctuations, or in some cases there are species that over the longer haul are um, declining for one reason or another, or in some cases even uh, increasing. We'll mention what some of those are in a bit too. Let's think about food and foraging strategies first. Um, as I suggested, there, there are lots of different techniques by which water birds obtain their food. And accordingly, there are quite a variety of different sorts of things that they eat. But since food is sort of a fundamental given for um, survival in most organisms, most animal species, it's clearly one of the things that can affect uh, the abundance and uh, in some cases, even the fluctuations of birds from year to year based on fluctuations in the food that the different species may be uh, looking for. So what's on the menu? Well, there's a variety of stuff. There are invertebrates, there are vertebrates, and there are even plants. So depending upon who you are or what kind of bird you are will depend a little bit on what you're looking for. The little creature in the upper left-hand corner uh, is an amphipod. It's actually a little crustacean, which means it's related to shrimps and lobsters and things. And there are some species that, that depend very heavily on, on amphipods. In the lower left is a blue mussel, a mollusk. And there are several species of winter water birds in the harbor that defend, depend almost exclusively on mollusks and in many cases, specifically blue mussels. So that's a real important prey species for a lot of the, uh, the winter water birds we find here. There are a few species that rely on fish, small fish. Um, the fish in the picture there in the upper right is a sand lance or sometimes called sand eel. It's one of the primary foods of a lot of the great whales that we see out on Stellwagen Bank and on the whale watching trips uh, out of the harbor. And it's, uh, it's a schooling fish that spends a lot of its time in the sand on the bottom, but then it comes wiggles its way out of the sand and often gets into huge schools where it's preyed upon not only by, by whales, but various seabirds as well. Then in the lower right is one of the, uh, the fairly common seagrasses that we find around the edges of the harbor. This is eelgrass. For any of you that have ever gone power boating in salt water, sooner or later, you're gonna probably get eelgrass tangled up on the propeller of your outboard motor or whatever, because it, it has, has a way of doing that. But it's, uh, it's a, a primary element in the, the diet of one of the water birds that we'll be talking about. So in terms of how the, the birds actually obtain these various foods, depends on the species. Some of them, like these little Bonaparte's gulls, as in Napoleon, um, 
sit on the surface and they, they swim, they sort of spin around, they pick and they dab at invertebrates, um, often, you know, sort of the large zooplankton organisms that you find in shallow water. There are some gelatinous little creatures that are somewhat related to jellyfish that are called salps, S-A-L-P-S, salps are, are commonly uh, relished by Bonaparte's gulls. And back in the days when Deer Island and Nut Island and all were pumping sewage into the harbor and treating it, um, that was, those were the days when Bonaparte's gulls were quite a bit more common in, in uh, Boston Harbor than they are today. So they're, they're taking smaller particulate matter than some of the larger species feed on. And I just point out, while I have this picture here, this is what the Bonaparte's gulls look like um, in the winter at this time of the year. In the summer, they have a black hood over their head. And in the winter, they just have a dark spot behind their eye and a little thin black bill. But they're very buoyant and, and almost turn-like in terms of watching them in flight. Loons, of which we have two species that are regular, regular in, in Boston Harbor, they dive from the surface and they only use their feet for propulsion. And you can see in this picture, this is a, a juvenile plumaged common loon, the, those big paddle-like feet that are placed well back on their body. It's just like an outboard motor and they can travel with, with great facility underwater as they pursue fish but they keep their wings very tight to their body so that they're, uh, they're like a, a torpedo with a little with propellers at the, the trailing end. Then there are birds that use both their wings and their feet for propulsion. And this is very typical of what a lot of the sea ducks do. Um, so that common eiders like the male on the left and the, the female to his right in the left image and the surf scoter um, these are what we call sea ducks because they, they are really pretty much maritime most of the year other than when they're nesting. Um, and if you look at the surf scoter out of the water, you don't often see scoters doing this. They kind of run along like they're in a, a, a foot race. But again, you can see that their feet are placed way back on their body. So they use those for propulsion, <coughs> excuse me. But as they dive from the surface, they also partially open their wings and use that as a, an additional source of, of um, power and, and also steerage. So in some cases, some of these water birds are using both their wings and their feet to uh, help them get to their food. And then there are some of them like this razor bill, which is in a, a, a family um, of birds that are called alcids. This would include things like puffins and murres and guillemots and things. They're almost penguin-esque in their appearance and in many respects, even the way they operate, except that unlike penguins, they can fly. Penguins are completely confined to the Southern hemisphere, but the alcids like the razorbill are sort of a, an ecological equivalent that we find in, in uh, Northern latitudes. And we only see them here uh, in most cases during the winter time, but they use their wings exclusively underwater. They actually fly underwater. So depending upon the type of, of diving bird it is, they can either use their feet, their wings and their feet or their wings only. So those are the sort of three options for um, way in which these guys can forage. And depending upon what they're after will depend on which style works best. For example, the alcids like the razor bill feed mainly on fish. So they have to really be able to tool around underwater at, at, with great precision and so forth. If you've ever been into the New England Aquarium and watched the penguins in the big giant tank, you'll see them flying around underwater. That's the same way that the razor bill would appear if you had it in a big aquarium and could watch it. The sea ducks on the other hand, which are largely seeking mollusks, which live attached on the bottom, uh, they don't have to be, um, particularly rapid swimmers, but they have to be strong swimmers to be able to dive deep enough and then dislodge things like mussels from the, the beds that are typical of the way uh, blue mussels live. And then there are things like the common loon that we described that um, uses its big feet to swim very rapidly in pursuit of fish. So they have to be powerful swimmers. And again, all these birds that dive from the surface and, and actively pursue 
fish are swimming forms under the water. Their feet are usually well back on their body. But then there are some like the northern gannet, which is a, um, a, a, a diving bird that dives from the surface. It's a plunge diver. It's also just by way of interest, it's the largest seabird in the North Atlantic. It's got a wing spread, it's about six feet. And it's a big bird with a sort of long slender neck and a chisel like bill, pointy bill, pointy tail, pointy wings in flight. I'll show you a picture of one in a moment so you can see what they look like when they're not in a full power dive. But these things will dive from, uh, from the wing, oftentimes well above the surface of the water. And they can make a very significant dive but they don't spear their fish the way you might suppose. They actually do a somersault underwater, and as they come up is when they grab whatever particular fish uh, they may be after. So they're very skillful. And by the time they come to the surface, they've usually already swallowed the fish. You don't see them holding a fish in their beak the way you might with something like a cormorant, for example. Then there are scavengers like gulls, I'm sure you've all variously seen ferry boats or been on boats where people are throwing popcorn or whatever off the back. But in the case of, of lobster fishermen and, and offshore fishing, um, fishing boats where there's a lot of bycatch and, and um, fish that are being gutted and cleaned, gulls, there's always a cloud of gulls and they do very well as scavengers. They do just as well at a McDonald's parking lot where they eat French fries and, and things of that sort, depending upon what kind of gull they are. But Gulls are inveterate scavengers. And back when we used to have open landfills and open dumps, they were always a major presence in those places, feeding on garbage and anything that they could uh, derive from uh, our refuse. Then there are some smaller birds that actually make a living by probing on rocks or in sand, um, what we call shorebirds collectively. This one is, is kind of a, a, a unique bird in that it's, um, it's one of the very few shorebirds or sandpipers that we regularly see in the winter. This is called the purple sandpiper. And as you can see, it really isn't purple, but it, there's a bit of a purplish cast to it. They're, they're sort of a steely gray. But they crawl around on, on wave washed rocks, constantly having to pay attention to, to when the next wave is coming so they don't get washed off. But they're feeding on invertebrates and things that are right in the rocks. Um, in some cases, barnacles. In some cases, it's the little um, amphipods like I, I showed you a minute ago that are about the size of your little finger, fingernail and so on. And then there are the, the grazers, the ones that feed on, on uh, aquatic plants, uh, marine plants. These are brant and their diet is largely comprised of, of eelgrass. Uh, they also eat one of the green algae called sea lettuce or ulva. Um, and they have an interesting history associated with this unique diet. Um, they're an Arctic nesting goose. They come a long way to get here. Um, but in the 1930s, the eelgrass all up and down the Atlantic coast was in, um, stricken with a, a, a blight that really uh, knocked down the eelgrass beds. And the brant, you know, for several seasons really took a hit. And it was actually during that period of time when their primary winter food was, was diminished, that they began to switch over and, and feed on um, sea lettuce. Uh, they also will come up and feed on, on green grassy areas right close to the seashore. They don't go to golf courses and things the way Canada geese do, but they will come out of the water. They'll, in, on Long Island, New York, they'll feed on the median strips where there's grass and so forth. So an interesting sort of vegetarian diet while they're here in the winter. So if we take each of these groups that have representatives that we've discussed, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about them as we could go along, but waterfowl, which is the collective term for ducks, geese, and swans, um, generally are sort of medium to large swimming birds. If you think about birds like mute swans, for example, you know, they're really a, a very good sized bird. Um, and they forage as a group in different ways. Some of them dive, some of them tip up in shallow water and some of them, um, like Canada geese, for example, will, will readily feed on land and in grassy areas, golf courses, soccer fields, that kind of thing. Most of the waterfowl of that sort have relatively broad flattened bills, although some of the ducks have very narrow 
uh, beaks. The fish-eating mergansers, for example, have very prominent serrations along the edges of their bill and their beaks are very narrow. And they, of course, dive under the water and can swim uh, very quickly in pursuit of, of fish. In many waterfowl, the males are strikingly patterned. There's, so there's a lot of difference in, in plumage between males and females. Most of them are highly migratory. Um, and a lot of them are more, a lot of species are more common in the winter than they are um, in the summertime. The point being, again, because they're migratory, a lot of them are coming from places not right at hand here uh, where they nest, either in the Arctic, the subarctic, or in some cases out on the uh, prairie pothole country of the Western United States. These are American black ducks. And this is a bird that was at one time quite a bit more common and sadly is declining for a variety of reasons having to do with destruction of habitat in the north where most of them breed or, or filling prairie potholes in this, you know, the, the central parts of uh, um, Canada and, and uh, the Northern Plains states here. And even in, uh, in the winter here, in many cases, uh, as our wetlands become sort of competed by with people and other activity, black ducks, which are primarily saltwater ducks in the winter, they are declining and they are legally hunted. So that's been another source of pressure on them. But they're very closely related to mallard ducks that a lot of you probably recognize with the green heads. And they commonly will interbreed with mallard ducks. They're very closely related so that um, they're, they're vitality is gradually being diminished by the less hardy um, gene pool of, of mallards as well. But they're pretty common in the shallows around the edges of Boston Harbor and they often will be seen feeding on mud flats at low tide. These are the eiders that we talked about. Um, eiders are the largest duck uh, in North America and uh, they're somewhat unique in that they have uh, the males are black underneath instead of on top. They exhibit a phenomenon called reverse counter shading, whereas a lot of birds and, and a lot of mammals for that matter are darker on top and lighter underneath. But eiders, it's reversed. But if you think about the fact that eiders feed mainly on blue mussels, they don't have to sneak up on their prey. Mussels don't move at all. Um, and some of the other shellfish that they will feed on don't move very quickly. So they don't have to be terribly sneaky about uh, sneaking up on their prey. But these are, um, interesting birds and this is one of the species of ducks that actually breeds in Boston Harbor but it didn't do that all for it hasn't done that for that many years it wasn't really until the early 70s and 1980s that eiders began to extend their breeding range south from Maine and colonize Massachusetts and now Boston Harbor is one of the principal areas where they breed other than some places down in Buzzards Bay and a few islands off the coast of uh, Essex County, north of Boston. They also are incredibly abundant in the winter, not necessarily in Boston Harbor, but off of Cape Cod, sometimes there can be flocks of, of thousands, literally thousands of eiders. You can practically walk across the, the water on their backs. And um, they generally are concentrated over these mussel beds where they dive to, uh, to get the mollusks off the bottom. The brown ones here are females and, and immatures, and the, the white and black ones are the males. Scoters, of which there's three species, are also prevalent in the harbor. Um, again, they're more, they're true sea ducks, so in many cases, they're more common really out on more exposed open ocean waters, again, around the Cape and off of Essex County and all. These are white winged scoters, the males with a little white teardrop around their eye. And you can see there's a little white patch showing on their sides in flight. It's a big white patch and they're, they're very easy to recognize in flight. But otherwise, they're basically all black. There's one or two females in the flock there that are brown. But uh, basically, the males with a little teardrop and the big white wing patch that the females also have is an easy way to distinguish those. And like eiders, they often are in big groups on the water that they, call, they refer to as rafts. So a lot of times you'll see rafts of scoters, sometimes even mixed in with eiders. Another of the scoter species is the surf scoter. 
And uh, as you can probably imagine, when I tell you one of the common nicknames for it, why? They call them skunk heads because they have these white patches on the front of the head and on the back of the head. And then they have this very peculiar colored bill, but like the eiders and like the white winged scoters, they're diving birds. They go to the bottom and they feed largely on mussels and other um, shellfish uh, of that sort of variety. The third scoter is the black scoter, which is all black. The surf scoter is all uh, black also on the wings. It doesn't have the white patch of the white wing scoter, but it has this peculiar looking sort of yellowish orange knob on the bill in the males. Females are brown, but the males are a little smaller than the white wing scoters, more nearly the size of the surf scoters, but are easily recognized um, if you get a good look at them, you know, with binoculars or if you get close to them in a boat, you can see those big yellow knobs, kind of interesting birds. So those are all what we call sea ducks. This is another group of, of sea ducks. Um, these are long-tailed ducks. These are the ones that I said used to be called old squaws. And these birds are a little different from the, the scoters and the eiders in that they're less dependent on mollusks. They feed very heavily on amphipods, which they, they, they dive and chase underwater because the amphipods, <coughs> excuse me, are in the water column. In other words, they're not anchored to the bottom the way mollusks are. So in areas where there are huge swarms of amphipods, that's a pretty good indication that there are long-tailed ducks that are gonna be chasing them. And of all the sea ducks, these guys can dive about as deep as any. Uh, they've captured um, long-tailed ducks in gill nets set at, at as much as 200 or more feet in, in um, under the water. So that's, that's pretty significant. Because remember, they're using their, 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 their wings partially open and their feet. Uh, to swim. <clears throat> the Graves um, is one of the outer islands in Boston Harbor, and that's Graves Light. And because of the, the rocks and, and the fact that it's one of the outer islands, it's an interesting place, particularly when we were able to go out on the winter boat trips. This is one of the sort of um, superstar birds that bird watchers always like to see. These are harlequin ducks. They like the outer, outer islands. They like areas often where there's heavy surf. They're tough little guys. They dive under the water uh, right in the breaking surf and right up against the, uh, the rocky islands and things. And um, this is one of the, the, the real signature species here. They're not that common. The, the best place to see them in Massachusetts is up off of Cape Ann, north of uh, Boston Harbor, particularly around Andrews and Halibut Point. The males are truly um, harlequin in their pattern. They often refer to these as lords and ladies um, because of their, uh, their rather distinctive plumage. They're not very big either. They're not as big as the scoters or the eiders, but these are also sea ducks. And the other thing that's is not feathered, but I thought I'd throw them in. I think they're one of the, the workshops this weekend was gonna be about seals. These are harbor seals. And this is another one of those things that we often look for around the graves. They like the outer islands. They haul out at low water so that um, they can uh, get some sun and, and sort of just loll around scratching themselves and doing what's, what seals typically do. They're really kind of fun to watch. Buffle heads, if you're somebody who watches the lottery at night and those ping pong balls bouncing around in those glass chambers, Buffle heads always remind me of uh, um, ping pong balls because they're very animated. They're little ducks. They dive and they, uh, they pop up. Sometimes a whole bunch of them like this will dive together and then they'll all start bobbing up to the surface at the same time. And because they're so white, they show up at a great distance. So they're not too hard to, to pick out. And curiously enough, um, this is one of those birds, if you follow the buffle head home, they don't nest anywhere in um, the eastern United States. They're a subarctic, su sort of a tundra nesting bird. They nest in holes in trees like wood ducks. Um, beaver ponds where the trees have died because of the beaver flooding and so forth. Um, and, and flickers and other kinds of woodpeckers will hollow out cavities. Those are the kind of things that buffle heads look uh, to nest in. So it's kind of an interesting variation on what many other waterfowl do. The only other one that regularly does that of the harbor winter 
birds is the common golden eye. They're also cavity nesters. Uh, these nest up in northern New England, but uh, they nest, they don't nest as far north as the buffalo heads, or I should say the buffalo heads don't nest as far south as golden eyes. This is the male. And just to make the point that I was saying earlier in terms of the difference between males and females in a lot of, of, of ducks, this is a female common golden eye. She's very different. She's got sort of a brown head and a gray body. They have a white wing patch. And uh, again, these are, these are both diving birds that are taking a variety of, of things like amphipods. They can take small amollus like periwinkles and things off the bottom. Uh, in the summer, when they're not here with us, they're often feeding on insect larvae that are in the uh, wetland areas where they breed up north again, like beaver ducks. These are the red-breasted mergansers that I mentioned with the very slender bills. Every day is a bad hair day for a red-breasted merganser. The males, there's one female there, the second one from the, uh, the left has got a brown head, but they have this always shaggy look to the head. And um, again, these are fish eaters, so that if you were to get a real close look at their beak, you'd see these little saw-like teeth right along the edges that are perfect for holding on to slippery, rapid swimming prey. So they dive under the surface um, and move around quite quickly but they're looking for fish. They're not looking for some of the things that the, uh, the big sea ducks are that are more inclined to be feeding on, on shellfish. Red-breasted mergansers. These are the brant. These are the vegetarians in the group. These are the ones that you often see working on, on uh, an eelgrass and places where eelgrass typically grows just beyond the, the, the low tide line. So you'll often see flocks of brant feeding in shallow water and um, that uh, there's eelgrass beds there. The um, immature brants uh, don't have that white slash on the side of the neck. They look like somewhat like miniature Canada geese, but um, not entirely the same for sure. So if we think about some of the other things that aren't water, loons, these are big birds. You know, if you ever remember seeing the movie on Golden Pond um, with Catherine Hepburn, on Golden Pond is um, basically a classic because there's lots of loon sounds plugged into the, 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 uh, the movie. They have these wonderful wailing calls that they give at night and any of you that have ever spent any time in Northern New England or Canada or whatever in the Lake Country, you probably have heard loons and uh, have been sort of dazzled by the spectacular vocalizations that they have. Their plumage is variable. They, their breeding plumage is quite different than the way we see them here. And we have actually two species that are regular in Massachusetts. The one on the left is the red-throated loon. It's slimmer, paler in color, doesn't have as heavy a bill, and it's mainly a saltwater bird uh, with us here in Massachusetts. The common loon, on the other hand, uh, is a freshwater breeder um, even in Massachusetts, it's not a common nesting bird here, but it's becoming more common, mainly in central and western parts of the state. But as you go north, they clearly are a, a, a featured resident of, of the lake country. And in both cases, their plumages are quite different in uh, breeding plumage or in summer, but this is the way you're likely to see them most often in the harbor. Grebes are somewhat closely related to, to loons. In many respects, they're somewhat similar. One of the subtle differences, if you ever want to bore somebody at a cocktail party, you can tell them, did you know that loons have webbed feet, but grebes have lobed toes? They have these little fleshy protection on their, on their projections on their toes. They're not joined, kind of interesting. And very distinct differences in breeding and, and winter plumage there also. You don't see grebes fly very often. We have two species that are most regular in, in Boston Harbor in the winter, the little horn grebe, which is basically gray and white, uh, with a little straight neck and a little short pointy bill. Um, but this is why they call them horn grebes because in breeding plumage, they have these wonderful sort of golden fluffy feathers on the side of their head that look like horns. But we don't see them in that plumage very often in Massachusetts because they don't, they don't nest with us. The other grebe is the bigger red uh, necked grebe but again, it doesn't have a red neck at the season of the year that we typically see them in the winter here, but it's a good deal bigger, longer neck, sort of a yellowish 
stout bill. And both species of, of grebes, like the loons, diving birds, feet well suited for catching mainly fish in both cases. The gannet, that big uh, plunge diver that I talked about with the heavy bill and the long pointy wings and so on, um, is quite a spectacular bird in, in a variety of ways. And while they don't nest with us here in Massachusetts, when they are migrating um, in, in um, fall, uh, particularly in November and early December, late October, and then again in spring and April and March, March and April, the adults are stunning, gleaming white with black wingtips and, and pointed hands. They look like a flying crucifix. And they um, have this sort of golden wash on the back of the head. But again, spectacular plunge divers. And we don't see them in the inner harbor very often, but on the, sometimes at the outer edges of the harbor, out near the graves, you can see them. And if there's stormy weather, they're often kind of pushed in closer to shore where you get a chance to see them. But if you really want to, it's a good advantage. If you go north um, to Canada, where most of the northern gannets in North America uh, breed, um, this is a, a big colony on the Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec near the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. This is Bonaventure Island. There are a couple of other big colonies in Newfoundland and other uh, areas up in that part of the world. But then they also breed on the other side, commonly nesting around Britain. And there's a big colony in Iceland. So it's a, it's a fairly common water bird in our part of the world, but they don't occur in the Pacific at all. So you won't see any gannets there. And if you were to travel down into the Caribbean and, and warm water waters, you might see some of their close relatives, the boobies of one sort or another. So they actually are a booby. But if you look at this map, you can see the brown sort of shows where most of our colonies nest in, uh, in North America. And the blue shows where they go for the winter. Cormorants, we have two species, but only one is regular in the winter in Boston Harbor. Um, that's the great cormorant. And sadly, it's, it's one that's um, not doing real well either, but it's widespread. It also occurs in Africa and Europe. And it's um, typical of, of most cormorants and it's largely black with a fairly long neck. They'll often see them sitting out with their wings uh, sun drying as it were. And they breed on the harbor islands in the case of the double crested cormorant. The great cormorant is the one that we see here uh, in the wintertime. It's got sort of a whitish throat pouch and um, that area up under its eyes is, is sort of a, a yellowish color. Double crested cormorant, it's more orange and it doesn't have a white throat. This is a young one, but it shows the posture that's very typical of um, cormorants and then that white belly. And in case you're wondering what's going on there, there's a great black back gull behind the cormorant, which is why the tail of this bird looks like it's you know, kind of swollen. It's kind of an unusual photograph. Hey, Wayne, we have some questions coming into the Q&A box. Would you like me to read a couple of those to you? Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, if you've only got a couple, I'm, I'm you know, close to finishing this up. So if, if why don't we, is it all right if we just leave all the questions to the end? Because sure, we only have a few minutes left. I know. And because of my slow start, I'm trying to just wrap this that's, up. That's all right. We'll get the questions uh, at the end here. So I mentioned uh, the shorebirds and the fact that most of them are typically things that we associate with beaches and mudflats in the summertime, but we do have um, several species that occur um, or, or linger here in the winter, even though most of them go a long way. A lot of the sandpipers and plovers and things that are closely related, uh, they go all the way to South America, some of them even to South America, this, Southern South America in the winter. This, these little guys are sanderlings. They're sort of frosty white and in areas where there's um, mudflats in the harbor islands, often there'll be little groups of sandlings running around chasing the, chasing the waves and, and, and pecking quickly at the sand. And they're often accompanied by another species, the Dunlin, which isn't quite as white. It's got a longer sort of droopy bill and it's browner on the back. But these two, in addition to the purple sandpiper that I mentioned, um, these are probably three of the most common or most frequent um, shorebird species, sandpiper species that we're apt to see in the winter, even though in the summer there's 
you know, there's a couple of dozen species that you could see along the shore. There's our friend, the purple sandpiper again. And as I mentioned, these guys are really rock lovers. They come from a long way away too. If you look at that map, a lot of them are coming from Greenland, Baffin Island, which is that uh, uh, a big island there that's shown in brown. And they don't go very far. They hardly go further than Maryland or the mid-Atlantic states. And they're not found on the West Coast at all. So, you know, for people who are really interested in adding new birds to their, their list, a lot of times they need to come to New England to, to catch up to purple sandpipers and they need to come in the winter because this is the only season of the year when they're here. And then the alcids, so to finish up with these guys, these are the ones that I said, like the, uh, you know, the puffin. I think a lot of people recognize puffins, at least they know what they look like. Um, the alcids are, are sort of Northern hemisphere counterparts to the penguins of the Southern hemisphere. Um, they have lots of variation in their bill shapes and, and uh, most of them feed on fish and or plankton. And, and uh, they're dramatically counter shaded, black on top and white underneath in almost all cases. This is our friend, the razor bill. This is the one that's um, along with another one that I'll show you, the black guillemot is the two that are most likely to be seen in Boston Harbor. This is one in breeding plumage. Their throat um, and, and neck is white in the, in the wintertime, but they're diving birds. They use their wings. They're very powerful swimmers underneath the water. And when you see one dive, they very seldom come up in the same place. So they can be really frustrating if you're trying to get a good look at, at a, a razor bill. And you'll see that they also are an Arctic bird. They breed around uh, Greenland. They breed in, in Labrador, Atlantic Canada, but they also breed as close as the coast of Maine. Some of you may have heard of Machaya Seal Island um, where there's also nesting puffins. So they breed in the same places that puffins breed occasionally. So that's a great opportunity if you ever travel to Maine and uh, have a chance to go out to Machaya Seal Island. It's a wonderful chance to see both puffins and razorbills in the same place. But some of the other alcids, like the murres, um, are cliff nesters and razorbills will often nest like this too. It's extraordinary to see them on these little narrow ledges and things where they uh, are struggling to uh, keep their eggs from rolling off the, the cliffs. Their eggs are what are called piriform in shape. They're very heavy at one end and pointy at the other. So um, the embryo, everything is, is centered in a way that if you were to spin run around on a ledge, rather than roll off it like an egg off a table, it just pretty much stays in, in one spot, which is an adaptation for this kind of cliff nesting. And then this cute little guy, these, this is a dovekey. And I mention this only because they're such a popular bird whenever we get a big storm or something drives them in close to shore. They're hardly the size of a pineapple. They're only about eight inches long, but they're cute little guys. And in their preferred habitat, they're incredibly abundant. Unlike the murres that I just showed you that nest on ledges, these things nest in the high Arctic in these talus slopes, these jumbled piles of big rocks and things. And they, they, you know, they go down underneath the, these rocks and, and uh, put their nest there. They feed on plankton. And this will give you an idea of just how abundant they are if you're in a place where um, they're nesting. I, I took this picture in the island of, of um, Svalbard, which is up Spitsbergen off Arctic Norway, way, way, way up north. They're about you know, 79, 80 degrees north latitude. They're very, very high Arctic birds. So it's a real treat when we get them down here, but sometimes they show up in the harbor and certainly along the coast, occasionally after big northeasterly storms. If you look at this map, you can see the blue is their winter range, but the green and those little patches of brown are places this side of the Atlantic where uh, the dovekies nest. This is the guillemot that I mentioned. This is one that's probably the most common in the harbor. This is what they look like in the winter. They have a big white egg-shaped patch on their wings, bright red lining to their mouth, bright red feet, and they dive like the other alcids for their food. But if you were lucky enough to see one in the summer and they breed as close as the coast of Maine, you can see them easily up there where they're all black. They still have that white uh, patch on the wings and those bright red feet. And they nest as close as the Isles of Shoals. 
you know, off the coast of Maine and New Hampshire. But this gives you a sort of greater sense of their distribution. They also go way, way up north and uh, just come down about as far as northern New England here on the East Coast. And there are in very few uh, in the Pacific at all. Gulls. Now, this is where it gets nasty, and I think I probably am going to cut this short a little bit. I'll just simply tell you that, that by virtue of um, the complexity of gulls, identifying them can be significantly challenging, and I don't want to take any more time uh, here now. I'd rather answer these questions, but simply give you some of the reasons why they're tricky. They take several years before they mature, usually two to four years for the big gulls like great blackbacks and herrings. They go through all these crazy changes in their plumage that make them difficult to identify. There's a lot of variation between one individual and another, so they don't even all always look the same, even if they're the same species. Some of them have differences in their plumage based on what part of their total global range they come from, so there's this geographic variation. They not infrequently hybridize, so you'll get hybrids that really are neither fish nor fowl, if you know what I mean. And some species are actually expanding their range so that there's a lot of, of, of rapid evolution taking place in gulls. So they're kind of a naughty problem. I'll just quickly run through these pictures. There's the herring gull in winter plumage with the streaks on its head, gray back with black wingtips. There's a young one to give you an idea how different the young ones look, brown. This is the great black back gull. This is the largest gull species in the world. And they nest in Boston Harbor as do the, the herring gull. So they're with us year round. They spend a lot of time at sea, however, they do a lot of their foraging out offshore. The ringbill gull, this is the, the fast food restaurant gull. This is the one you're most likely to see taking French fries off the parking lot or places where people are feeding them. And as you go south in the winter in Florida, ringbill gulls and laughing gulls are very, very common. They have yellow instead of pink legs, and the adults have these nice little black rings on them. And if you look at their range, they're found in sort of tiers across the country. You know, they breed up north, they migrate through the, the yellowish area, and then they spend the winter in the blue area. So they have a pretty broad range and they're quite common pretty much throughout North America. This is a strictly winter bird. This is the Iceland gull, comes to us from the far north, no black on the wingtips, quite a handsome bird. And they're often in the harbor. If you look through big flocks of gulls, you're often going to have a chance of picking out an Iceland gull. That shows you how far north they're coming from. Curiously, they don't breed in Iceland, however. <laughs> and then our little Bonaparte's gulls that we, like we saw earlier, and I told you these guys in the summer have black hoods. It's also, here's another cocktail party factoid for you. This is the only North American gull that nests in trees. And they don't nest in the United States except in Alaska but they do nest all the way across the boreal north in coniferous forests and so forth. Uh, but they build these little stick nests in the top of these spruce and fir trees. You can see what their range looks like in the brown there. And the black-legged kittiwake, which is probably the most abundant gull in the world, uh, is often described as looking like it has wingtips that were dipped in ink. It's got a yellow bill. It does have black legs. And it's a, what we call a pelagic gull. It spends most of its time at sea, um, not, not inshore. Like an, that's not a common bird in Boston Harbor at all. That's kind of what the adults look like with their black legs. And then as we return on our, our virtual trip from um, the harbor. Hey, Wayne. Yes. I'm actually going to have to interrupt you for just one second. Um, so it is time for our next presentation, but that is on a second. Um, that is on a separate Zoom link. So I'm gonna have you pause for just a second and we're gonna yeah. introduce that next session and provide that link. And then right. I'm gonna let you keep going and we'll answer some of well, these I'm, awesome questions I'm like two slides away from done. So if you want, I'll just mention the snowy owl and then I'll talk about it after it's off the screen if you want. But since on our way back in, we go by the airport, that's a place where snowy owls often may be found in the winter. And that's always one of the birds that the, the winter boat trips are always keen to see, and it has an interesting story, but it's not a water bird. So finally, as we end a lovely day in the harbor, uh, the snowy owl was our signature bye-bye uh, bird. So there you go.
That was wonderful, Wayne. Thank you so much. And like you I mentioned, me we just... will circle back around. And so I'm going to introduce our next um, presenter and we'll provide a link that goes into that next session. And then for those who want to have their questions answered by Wayne or want to stick around, you can still stay here on that platform as well. All right. So, so Wayne, this... would you mind stop sharing your screen for a second? Thank you very much. I'll just All take... right. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for attending this wonderful session. Thank you, Wayne, for all of this wonderful information. That was absolutely fabulous. Um, so our next session, which is the final program of our second day here of the very first Winter Wander, um, will be our Green Ambassadors Sunday Fun Day. So this is going to be on a new Zoom link because it's going to be a slightly different platform um, that will allow more face-to-face -face interaction between you and our wonderful Youth Green Ambassadors. Um, so I am going to pass you over now to uh, Kalik, who's going to, who is one of our Green Ambassadors, and he's going to give you a little sneak peek. Hi, the next session will be held by Green Ambassadors. Green Ambassadors is a youth group uh, through a partnership with the National Park Service and Outward Bound. Uh, pretty familiar with the Boston Harbor Islands. And the next session, we'll be hosting some fun activities and games. And like if you come and stop by, and we look forward to winter wandering with you all. Thank you so much. It's gonna be very fun. I got to sneak peek some of those games myself. It's, it's pretty awesome. So make sure to head over there and uh, visit with our Green Ambassador friends. Thank you so much. All right, so I have put the link for that event into the chat. Um, so feel free to head over there to Green Ambassadors. Um, and then for those of you who are sticking around here for Wayne, um, I will start reading some of those questions out. All right, so one of our first questions for you, Wayne, um, is it surprising that the eider nesting areas seem to be moving south while many species ranges seem to be shifting more north with climate change? That, that's a very insightful question because it, it is sort of an anomaly. Uh, the great majority of bird species whose ranges seem to be expanding are expanding from more southerly areas into more northerly areas. For example, going back to the late 50s and 1960s, the, the northern cardinal, the tufted titmouse, and the northern mockingbird, three fairly common suburban type birds, all began to expand significantly. Now they breed all the way up north to Canada. And there have been a, a host of other species that have followed in their footsteps. So the eider is definitely uh, an anomaly there. And there, there are two things that happened in Massachusetts, but I think they're really not terribly connected. There was a, a professor at, at Framingham State um, College, or now university, I guess, that uh, was interested in, he was studying sea ducks, and he took and he introduced eiders um, into Buzzards Bay, and he established a small toehold population of common eiders that started to breed in Buzzards Bay. And that population began to expand. But about the same time, somewhat coincidentally, eiders from further north, probably from Maine, began to establish a toehold on some of the Boston Harbor Islands, and then also up of, on some of the islands off of Essex County. Until now, there's a really quite a substantial population in those areas, plus the Buzzards Bay population, which did have a jump start, but nonetheless was able to get itself established. And in terms of the, the explanation for that, I honestly don't have an explanation because, you know, there are some other birds that are doing the same thing. There's a little falcon called the Merlin that was always a Canadian breeder. And all of a sudden they started nesting in Maine. And now they, you know, there's small numbers nesting in Massachusetts and Northern New Hampshire and so forth. And they're kind of doing the same thing that the eiders did. In other words, they're shall we say, flying in the face of climate change. And why that is, hard to say. I really honestly don't know, but that, that was a very good question. And I, don't, I, don't, I can't give you a quick answer for that because I just don't know. Well, that was still a great answer. Yeah, it's a really fascinating, fascinating issue. Um, so one of our next questions um, is about the loon that you showed. So the loon you showed is much lighter in color and different in markings than the loon that people commonly see in Minnesota and in the West. Is it right. the same species? It is, but it's a different plumage. In other words, loons, a lot of these birds, 
you know, have different plumages in the summertime and in, their, in the wintertime. And in the case of the loon, that was a juvenile loon, but that doesn't mean that it was a baby loon that was photographed on a northern lake. I photographed that, that loon on Cape Cod. Loons, for the most part, common loons that is, even though they breed on interior northern lakes, most of them winter on salt water. And accordingly, by the time we see them in the wintertime here, they've already started to molt and change their feathers into what their, their non-breeding or winter plumage looks like. So that juvenile plumage loon that I showed you looks very much like what an adult common loon would look like if you saw it at this time of the year. And then, you know, in another few weeks, gradually um, adult loons that are spending the, the you know, gonna return north if they're of an age to go back north because they, they, they spend almost two years on salt water. They don't return to the lakes typically until they're two years old. So most of the loons that you see in the summer on the ocean are gonna look like the one I showed. But as you properly pointed out, eventually they're gonna get, you know, they're gonna have white polka dots all over their back. They're gonna have a, a collar. They're gonna have a dark hood and they're gonna make all sorts of wonderful stuff once they're adults. But that's, that's just a matter of seasonality. And in the case of the individual I showed you, it's also because it's a juvenile. Okay, wonderful, thank you for that. Yeah, I grew up in the West, so I know when I first came to uh, Massachusetts, I was definitely confused by that as well. They looked and the red, the red the loons of my loon, childhood. Which, the red-throated loon, which was the other species, the same story holds. They're a, a more northerly, they're a subarctic and Arctic nester, but they have a breeding plumage that looks different than um, the way they look when we see them here in the winter. Gotcha, thank you. Um, so one of our next questions is, um, why do male and female birds have different plumage colors and what is the evolutionary benefits for that? Well, you've got some good people, some sharp people. Some I know, right? Good questions, absolutely. Well, in the case of ducks, um, and in, actually in many bird species, the males are typically, in, in most species, the majority of the world's bird species tend to be the more colorful or the more extravagant in, in plumage or whatever. Um, and it is, it's generally thought and, and rightfully believed that um, they, they're the principal go-getters when it comes to establishing a pair bond and finding a mate and so forth. So it's to their advantage, advantage to be um, handsome. Uh, it's kind of the different difference with people where I think in many cases, uh, males are attracted to females, but in, in many bird species, the females are attracted to the males. So the males oftentimes tend to be somewhat more gaudy in their, their plumage and so forth. So and, and that, that's one reason. The other is that um, in waterfowl at least, and, and many water birds, uh, the females do much of the incubation and much of the caring for the young, spending more time at the nest, if you're a gaudy looking red-breasted merganser or, or you know, a mallet or a pintail or a harlequin duck or whatever, you don't wanna give away your nest location. The females tend to be brown, streaky, much more camouflaged. And again, that in all probability has to do with the fact that they're more concerned with maintaining safety for their, their eggs and, and at the point in the season when they're very vulnerable. The other thing is there's a dark side to this too, particularly as it relates to sea ducks, but also some of the freshwater ducks. They are significantly delinquent dads. They don't stick around very long. In other words, in Boston Harbor in the spring, when we're out there censusing eider, eider so, so forth and so on, it's almost all females. You're flushing the females off the nests. Later on when the eggs hatch, you'll see the, the eider broods bobbing around out near the graves and things with these little ducklings, hardly any males around at all. In some cases, eiders and other sea ducks, the males um, abandon the females almost as soon as they're on eggs. And they will often migrate sometimes many miles to remote areas, you know, saltwater coves and things or in some other species of ducks, they go to remote lakes and things because they go through a molt that renders them flightless. It's called eclipse plumage. So again, they're particularly vulnerable when they can't fly and it's to their advantage to not hang around 
inshore in the case of the sea ducks like the eiders and things, you know, or, or be with the babies, which potentially might attract more predation in the direction of the young. So again, good question, but it's, it has to do with, with, with courtship and the whole reproductive cycle, basically. All right, gotcha, thank you. Um, so what do most of water birds do during large storms like nor'easters? That's, it. That's an, uh, yet another good question. Um, in, in case of the, the, the real true seabirds, things like gannets, alcids, you know, like the razor bills, the little dovekies and things, uh, and some of the other species that, that I didn't talk about that really aren't present, particularly in Boston Harbor in the summer, they are adapted to life on the open ocean. And in some cases, they will ride out the storm on the water. In some other cases, they will outmaneuver the storm. In other words, they, they can, you know, they can move around a storm and stay out of its way. But in extreme cases, they can get into trouble. Um, hurricanes, for example, in the fall and late summer, sometimes will, will bring birds from the Caribbean or the southeastern coast of the United States. They'll get, birds will get caught in the eye of the storm. And as the eye passes either over land or off the coast of New England, they'll manage to get out of the eye of the storm and, and they'll end up exhausted or in some cases they'll, they'll end up dead on the beach or they'll show up in interior lakes and things where they don't belong because they've, they've literally been deflected uh, by the storm. And when, the, when I was talking about the little dovekies, one of the things about dovekies, because they're small, um, sometimes there, there have been and there are with some frequency what are called dovekie wrecks where they are sufficiently small, the ocean is so rough that the plankton that they feed on gets driven down deeper than they can dive. And they literally, from exhaustion, they'll get pushed up against the shore, or in some cases, they'll get literally blown inland. I remember as a kid, I grew up in Wellesley, and the first dove key I ever saw was when I was in junior high school, and there was a dove key in a pond right down the street from my house. First one I ever saw, and I, you know, I couldn't believe it. But it turned out that that particular storm, there were dove keys in a lot of places. There were reports of them coming from inland. And so their options are different depending upon what kind of bird they are. The, the bigger, stronger ones, uh, like gannets, for example, gannets very seldom get blown inland, but they'll get blown to shore. So in a big Northeaster, if you're on the coast on the, the backside of Cape Cod or places like, uh, again, up at Cape Ann that stick out in the water, Sometimes you'll see hundreds of gannets going by, but they're not actually getting blown overland or inland. But some of the smaller species, that can happen to them. So again, it depends on what kind of bird they are. It depends a lot on what sort of food, what, what they need for food. If they're, they feed on prey that, that because of the, the storm and the turbulence gets driven deeper than they can dive, they, they can get into trouble you know, and either get beached or, or uh, literally destroyed by the, the winds. I mean, I know how hard it is to be on the ground during a nor'easter, so I'm really glad I'm not a... Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, I'll tell you, if you're a, if you're a bird watcher, um, <laughs> again, there's a dark side to this, but for people who want to enjoy some of these seabirds that they normally don't get to see because they're way out offshore or whatever, um, a big nor'easter is often a you know, like mana from heaven, it will blow these birds in closer to shore where you do get to see them either going by um, or in some cases they'll be in the water a day or two after the storm, just bobbing around. Places like Provincetown, you know, because of its, its geographical location, Provincetown Harbor is a great place to look for seabirds after a big northeaster because they often will seek shelter in, in those kinds of situations. And the same is true with Cape Cod Bay. You know, birds will get into the bay and it's like a big basket. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, so I think our final question we'll take live today. Um, what can our virtual visitors and the visitors who visit the park physically, um, what can they do to help support uh, their local water bird species? Well, one thing that, and this may come as a surprise, is don't feed them. One of the things that a lot of, a lot of communities that are, you know, fairly close to the coast, almost every town has a duck feeding pond where people go and they, you know, they throw bread and corn and things. And for waterfowl and, and, and so forth, that's really not doing them any favor because it's getting them habituated 
for circumstances that really are not the best for them. And often in these relatively small ponds, you know, because of the numbers of, of gulls and, and geese and, and other waterfowl and things, eventually uh, there can be bacteria build up that can be pernicious to the birds that are feeding there and so forth. And, and it, it, it even habituates them to a certain extent to people. So when the hunting season starts, you know, you always get these, these characters that go to the local duck feeding pond and oh great, we're gonna start off the season, shall we say, with a bang. And uh, you know, the poor ducks aren't used to getting shot at, so it doesn't necessarily work to their advantage. So that's one thing. Um, and you know, there are, there are certainly other things. A lot of the birds that we were talking about today in terms of the Boston Harbor are birds that it's, it's a little more difficult, shall we say, to, to give a leg up to. Um, in the case of wood ducks, which we didn't talk about, wood ducks are freshwater waterfowl and they nest in holes. And if you've ever driven by a wetland or been to a place where you see these big boxes out in the water on posts and things, those are boxes that are put there specifically to attract wood ducks and also hooded mergansers, a different merganser than the one that I was talking about. But the point is for things like buffleheads and golden eyes that nest in cavities further north, you know, it, the fish and game agencies in Maine, for example, and, and the Canadian Wildlife Service, they'll put boxes in suitable places for those cavity nesting species because, you know, there's only so many holes that are of appropriate size. And eventually, if they're in a, a tree that's in standing water, which is usually what the birds select, those trees rot and fall down. So, you know, that would be the sort of thing you can do. Um, but for a lot of the others, I think basically just, you know, don't disturb them, especially in the case of the shorebirds, things like the Sanderlings and Dunlin. Um, it's not so much of a problem in the winter, but in the summer, Sanderling and Dunlin and, and other sandpipers gather in huge flocks during migration and stop along the coast of Massachusetts to forage on mudflats and things. You don't want to just go walking through a flock of, of either resting shorebirds, which is what they do at high tide, or at low tide when they're out in the mudflats, Sometimes you'll see somebody with a dog and the dog is chasing the shorebirds around. They have to feed, they have to, I mean, they're here to put on the body fat that they've, they've spent, they've used up getting themselves from the Arctic to New England. And they're gonna reinforce, you're gonna fuel up again here before they head for South America or whatever. So, you know, giving birds space and, and you know, not disturbing them where they're heavily concentrated. Anytime that there's places where birds concentrate in large numbers, as I sort of intimated at the beginning of the presentation, they're there in most cases because either there's abundant food of the sort they're looking for, or you know they're get, they're deriving some other benefit, either shelter from weather or whatever, and um, you know not disturbing them. Unfortunately, even some of these birds, like the ones we've been talking about, do get into conflict situations with people. For example, on the Cape particularly around Chatham, um, because of changes in the, the uh, configuration of the barrier beaches there and all, uh, the conditions now have, have allowed for tremendous numbers of mussels to build up. So there's big mussel beds right off the coast of Chatham there, right, right practically in Chatham Harbor. And as a result, um, in the winter, there's thousands of eiders, thousands of common eiders that are in there feeding on those mussels. Well, unfortunately, there are people whose livelihood depends on harvesting mussels. I mean, I like to eat mussels. You probably like to eat mussels too. And that's the way you got to get the mussels from somewhere. But if you've got thousands of eiders that are feeding on your source of livelihood, that's not a great thing. So there's a down on the Cape, for example, there are there's a lot of controversy about whether um, what to do about these eiders. And the other thing is for anybody that's familiar with, with the Outer Cape, there's a huge population of gray seals there now too, which are much larger than our, our harbor seals, which are mainly wintering seals. And you know now there's all this concern about great white sharks. I know I'm going into the bushes a little bit here, but in point of fact, there are these circumstances that develop with, with different types of wildlife, including birds, that uh, can result in a conflict. So your question was, what can people do to kind of give them a leg up. I think support the Harbor Islands groups and, and the National Park Service and, and that's looking out for wildlife in the harbor. 
that's one of the things, you know, participating in programs like this, and, and hopefully you'll have the winter wildlife trips again in the wintertime, and there's all kinds of opportunities to visit the Harbor Islands in the summer. You know, those things for the most part are relatively benign activities and, and uh, you know, supporting those would be sort of in that spirit too. But it, it's a good question. And as I say, I think the thing that, that's curious about it is a lot of the birds that I was talking about today are not the kind of birds that it's easy to help in the same way that you can feed birds in your yard or you can plant native shrubs and things that, that give, you know, produce berries and things that they like to eat. So it's a little harder to uh, be as aggressive, but certainly by supporting any of the organizations like Mass Audubon that I work for, you know, that's what we're, one of the things we're, we're in the business to do is, is protect birds and bird conservation and so on, so. Well, what, thank you, Wayne. That was really, that was a fantastic answer. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us in this virtual festival. Thank you for this fantastic presentation and sharing your vast, vast knowledge with all of us. We so very appreciate it. And thank you to all of you who joined Winter Wander as participants. Um, this was our very first year of doing it, but it's been a huge success. So hopefully it will be a uh, permanent staple in years going forward. Um, so all of these sessions have been recorded. They will be posted. Um, and those will be coming out probably on the park uh, YouTube page as well as Facebook pages. So keep an eye out for those. Um, Wayne, there are lots of thank yous and praise coming into the chat for you. Um, it was absolutely fantastic presentation. Thank you so much.